Hello everyone and I hope you're all doing very well. So today we're going to do the buyer's guide slash review for the MiG-21 BIS in DCS World. So the way we're going to do this guide is we're going to make it as unbiased as I possibly can and we're going to use the following categories. One, we're going to look at the capability of the aircraft so that includes weapon systems, sensors and navigation. Two, you may or may not be interested but we're going to look at the kinetic performance compared with other planes in DCS. Three, we're going to look at the visual effects inside of the cockpit and outside and we're going to rate that between one and five. One being awful and five being really good. Then we're going to look at sound effects, sound effects inside the cockpit and external sound effects. Again we're going to rate that between one and five. Next is interactivity and detail. We're going to rate that between one and five and that's going to be how we as a human interact with the aircraft through the cockpit by pushing the switches and turning the dials and whatnot and how much detail is in there how many of the controls are modeled how many of the controls actually do what they're supposed to do and so on then we're going to look at the flight model how the thing flies and we're not really going to be looking at how realistic it flies compared to the real mig-21 because the fact is well no one really knows who's going to fly dcs what we're more looking for is how immersive the flight engine is of this aircraft how it makes you feel like you're in a real mig-21 make sure there's no obvious errors or anything that makes it feel like it doesn't feel right and regard these categories that are rated one to five i'm going to say as i go through this video what i rate this aircraft now that is subject to change because you know you do just change your mind once i've reviewed other aircraft i may change how i want to do this and whatnot so what i'll do is i'll link in the video description a database of all the aircraft that I've done so far and I'll have my scores in there in case I need to change them at some point you can go and see there what my kind of official score is and as well as that I'll have the Reapers put their scores in as well so you can get other viewpoints other than mine next is difficulty difficulty of operation so for instance one would be an A10A where you can just get in it and literally learn a couple of keys and that's all you need and five would be an A10C where it's a study level sim you've got to study the 400 page manual and you've got to practice everything 10 times before you can do it and one or five isn't particularly good or bad it's just telling you what difficult E level it is so you know what to expect and eight is a history since the modules come out how much trouble has it been has it been bugged a lot? Has it been a smooth ride? And it's just something that people, I think, have the right to know. Okay, so first we're going to start with capability, so let's get in the cockpit. Okay, we're in the cockpit now. The first thing we'll do is look at weapons. So this was a very late 50s, very early 60s, primarily a quick Mach 2 interceptor. It was here to shoot down nuclear bombers that were threatening Russia or the Soviet Union. That said, this version could also do limited ground attack. And bearing in mind the time that this was operating, it's actually got quite good, quite comprehensive ground attack ordnance. Bear in mind there weren't, you know, complicated guided missiles back then like Mavericks and whatnot, or the Soviet, you know, KH equivalent. So it does pretty well. So if we go for the central pylon first of all, you can see it's got the pylons five, four, two and one for weapons, three and weapons uh, fuel tanks or miscellaneous and six and seven are for miscellaneous so if we go to central pylon which is pylon three where do we start we can have a sps 141 100 this is a ecm type jammer i've tested it tested it thoroughly against other aircraft and dcs and to be honest it's not very good but it's there and does give you some level of protection we can also get a fuel tank one problem of course is you'll probably already know about the mig 21 if you're looking to buy this is that it has a very short range so almost all sorties you'll be taking some sort of fuel extension bombs on the central pylon and you'll really like this the only uh, nuclear capable bomber in dcs at the moment that you can fly the rn24 the rn28 you've, again you've probably already looked at these these are tactical nuclear weapons and the cool thing is you can use them in this you can arm them you can drop them when you select these rns you get a separate little uh, nuclear bomb panel that comes up here and you can drop them they detonate now they're not modeled now they're not modeled per se in terms of their damage in dcs if you drop them they'll blow anything up in the air instantaneously but so within you know a couple of miles but you know there's no mushroom cloud it's not a proper model like you'll get in armor with the modifications and stuff like that but it's still there it's still a bit of history and it's a bit of fun so if we go to the normal wing ordnance wing pylons we're going to go two here right where do we start uh we start at bombs 
We've got a pretty decent array of bombs, like I said, for the era that this was operating in. We've got here BL755. I assume the 755 is the amount of kilos that the bomb weighs, I don't really know, but it is an anti-light and heavy armour cluster bomb. Next we've got the beta or the B-Tabs as I call them. These are anti-runway bombs, possibly anti-structure bombs as well. They are awesome. If you haven't seen them being used before, then I suggest Googling it or uh, YouTubing it see someone using them, you drop them, they come down on a parachute, then they have rockets on them that fire and slam them into the tarmac, below the tarmac, and then they blow up, blow up below the tarmac outwards. Uh, so uh, incredibly cool bombs. Quite hard to use, I've uh, really struggled to use them, but they are very good if you can use them properly. Next is an FAB-100, this is a standard issue 100 kilo slick unguided bomb, or a rack of four of them, or a 250 kilo version, or a 500 kilo version, about 1,000 pounds. Then we get the RBKs. These are cluster bombs, 250 kilos and 500 kilos. I think they are anti-personnel and anti-very light armor. I stand to be corrected, but that's what they are from memory. And an SAB 100, which is an illumination type of bomb. So that's pretty comprehensive. I'm just gonna make sure we can't take any more on the outer pylon. So we go back and next we get, we try missiles, so air to ground missiles. So one of the best things about the MiG-21 is you get to use the Grom missile. As a human, one of the most satisfying things in life must be to be in a MiG-21 in DCS, firing a KH-66 Grom and it hitting your target. It's very good fun. My knowledge is limited, but it is a large warhead heavy missile we can carry two of them i believe and they're what we call beam radar beam riding missiles so we'll put our radar beam mode on i can't remember how to do it now but it, and it shines a beam basically at whatever point our crosshair at and the missile will guide down that beam and hit it so the idea of my pilot is i keep this this uh, reticle here trained on the target and the missile will follow that radiation beam from me to the target and hit it that way uh, very challenging very rewarding and when it hits it's a real big missile so it's a big thump pods again uh well, this time we can have a upk 23 this is a 20 mil uh, sorry 23 mil cannon for if you want the extra gunfire it's a, it's a really the 23 mil is a really good russian cannon and that is anti-ground but technically that can be used in anti-air as well i should say at this point on board we also have on board cannon it does have limited ammo but it is still a pretty good cannon. Next, we've got the rockets. Uh, so these are the more traditional rockets, the UB-16, the UB-32. The number denotes how many rockets are in the pod. Now, forgive me, I don't know the size of them, but they are pretty small diameter. They're gonna be mainly anti-infantry and anti-light armor. We can have one pod per pylon, or we can have the S-24. The S-24 is a single, high caliber, very damaging rocket. And you can fire this against structures, runways, ships, anything of that nature. You get an A and a B version. Um, my apologies, I forget which is which. Different warheads, presumably. These big rockets are a really cool thing. A lot of the Russian aircraft, this and newer, have that a lot of the NATO equivalents don't have. They can be genuinely really useful. Next is air to air. Okay, so uh, how are we gonna do this? I think we're gonna go through the old style, uh, side, what I call the old style sidewinders. So my understanding of these, and I stand to be corrected, I'm purely doing this from memory, probably been over a year since I've actually uh, covered this aircraft properly. The, these R models from R13 up to R55 were old, uh, if you like, Russian imitations of early Sidewinders with varying seeker heads. So you've got the R13, if you like, it's an old IR seeking missile with about six to eight kilometers range. An R3R is a similar missile with about eight kilometers range, but it is radar guided. You've got the R3S about eight kilometers range with, I believe that was IR guided, an R55, slightly extend range, but the same type of missile. And that was radar guided, I believe. Um, and I think these guys were semi-active radar homing, 55 and the 3R. If we skip over for the R60 for the time being, we've got the RS2US. Now I think this was the old original beam riding missile. So I don't, really and it's not something you're ever going to use other than for kind of for fun i don't think you'd ever use it in any kind of competition but it was there's a big fat air-to-air -air beam riding missile that you'd point at a, a slow maneuvering or a not maneuvering at all bomber or something like that uh, now they're all cool for history but you'd never actually use any of them these are well unless you really wanted to use the radar these are the contemporaries the r60s and the r60 mics the r60s are the old if you like they're the 
fully Russian made versions equivalent of a Sidewinder if you like. They are relatively short range IR seeking missiles. The R60 was older and it has what we call a rear aspect only so you can only shoot a hostile when they are heading away from you. And the Mike version here is an all aspect where you can shoot a hostile when he is more or less at any aspect. So much more modern. So the R60, unless you really want a challenge, is the only thing you're going to use. And you can take uh, two on this pylon. Regards range, it's going to, I mean, range is hard to say, but up to a maximum of 10 kilometers, I think, with a head on target. So certainly no long range uh, radar guided missile. Everything's relatively short range here, but that's just how it was at this time okay i'm just going to make sure we've not missed anything on uh, pylon one it's just the same stuff uh, fuel tanks on the outer pylons we can have and often needed and on the rear here we can have um, additional aso 2s these are the uh, countermeasures you know chap and flare unfortunately this aircraft does not have built-in methods uh, not the this version we've got here and the sprd 99 really cool thing these are these are if you like rocket bods that we strap to the rear hind of the aircraft the rear fuselage and we use them on takeoff to get airborne really really quickly and then you jettison them now what we found is that you can actually use them in the air if you like if you're in a dogfight or something you can use them to get away from the target really quickly uh, something that's like this aircraft all over really really kooky really fun it reminds me a bit of like a hardcore version of the Vigan pylon 7 uh, is just smoke internal gun with air to ground or air to air Next is the sensors, and it does have, technically have, a lot of modern sensors on it, but they are really early incarnations of them. So we've got a radar warning receiver here, but it's very, very basic. It'll tell you the very basics that you are being searched by a radar, you're being tracked by a radar, and I think it's got a missile warning launch feature on it as well. But as for adding to your situational awareness, it's pretty terrible, to be honest. As for where that missile is coming from, what type of radar is firing that missile, what type of radar is searching you and stuff like that. So it's a very basic. We've also got a search and track and firing radar here. Well, this is the scope, I should say. Again, very basic. I can't remember the range now, but it's going to be up to about, for search, about 40 miles, 60 clicks, I would imagine, something like that. And I imagine you could be tracking targets up to about 20, 30 miles. Stand to be corrected, but, you know, this is all... Just very rough what I'm doing at the moment. So a short range basic radar can be used to find small jets as well as bombers. A lot of people who fly this aircraft in PVP servers don't even use the radar. They'll just use their eyes. It's, it's there if you want to use it. And it's basic and it just about does the job. But it's nothing obviously compared to a modern, more contemporary fighter. Regards to the HUD, I'm not sure we can really call it a HUD, it's more of a gun sight. I think in fact we should just call it a gun sight. Similar to what I would say to the F5, it can give us information to help us aim through radar and or gyro means. So we've got for instance a gun pipper here, we could use it for our gun or use it for our missiles or whatever we're going to use. And that could be used and we could lock onto targets and it would allow us to show us the lead that we need to hit a target if it's maneuvering for instance or we could use it like i said earlier to guide our uh, radar guided missiles in or we could use it as a non-gyro to drop bombs and fire rockets with in that case we would have a depression knob i think that's here maybe it's not going to work at the moment uh sorry angles over here and we can actually depress this pipper here and uh, allow us to give us basic manual aiming for bombing so that's the best we're going to get we've got no modern computers here to do the computation for letting off bombs and letting off rockets like you would in a modern you know harrier vigan flanker f14 f18 and so on so it's really done by manual means with aid from a very realistic gun sight okay so next we want to look at navigation and this is not an all-weather fighter it does not have if you like tactical navigation like one of the modern aircraft is you can't put a waypoint somewhere or several waypoints and find those waypoints all we've got like the f5 is the ability to find really air bases and friendly air bases so we've got uh, the equivalent of TACAM. this is rsbn here it allows us to find and navigate to a soviet airfield via radio means that is in range of detection 
If that fails, we've also got an ADF type system called ARC, A-R-C or A-R-K I think it's actually called. Again, that just allows us to navigate to transmitting radio towers, usually on the edges of runways. And we do also, uh, the F-5 does not have any kind of ILS, instrument landing system. This does as PRMG. Uh, not an easy thing to use, I'm not going to lie, it's difficult to use, but it is a genuine ILS in the true meaning of the word ILS. It will guide you in zero visibility down to a runway and pretty much allow you to land. Because of that, maybe it actually can be a considered an all-weather fighter and because it's got a radar, I'm not really sure, I'm not sure what the definition is. But again, my point is, as far as navigation is concerned, it'll tell you how to get back to base, how to land, but that's as far as it goes. Everything else is going to be maps and charts and radio signals and whatnot. Next, we're going to go on to visual effects. First, we'll look inside the cockpit. And everyone has their own idea of what good and what's bad visual effects within reason. So what I'm mainly going to do here is just take a few minutes and look around the cockpit and you can judge for yourself. This, to me, is average to good in terms of um, you lose a little bit of detail. Maybe it's actually up to good. The textures, you're losing a little bit of detail when you zoom in, but nothing too bad. I've seen worse. The actual dash itself is pretty awesome. Again, a little bit of detail being lost here, so maybe it's showing age. It's aged a little bit. You kind of got extruded, if you look along here, extruded surfaces, uh, texture surfaces. But very rarely will you be paying this much attention. Shadows and everything are beautiful. This is looking on 1080p, obviously. I'm not sure what it would look like on a on higher resolution. Losing a little bit of detail down there. Instruments, beautiful, beautifully done. This dash face, really, really good. All down here, properly good. Yeah, and losing a tiny bit of detail on the stick and textures, but, you know, no one actually looks this closely at things. A bit scruffy down there. And there's a very, very busy cockpit. The aircraft can just do quite a lot of stuff and everything is manual, everything switches and gauges so you just need a lot of stuff as you radio, lots of circuit breakers, main switches, in back. Copy as a whole, I mean the dash as a whole. Going to take a look outside. Show. Plenty of detail down there for the undercarriage.
Okay, so all round pretty good. Now it's starting to show its age a little bit with, you know, the, the ultra uh, realistic looking ones like the Tomcat and the F-18 coming out at the time of making this. But all round it's good, solid inside and outside, good, solid model. So for visual inside and outside, I'm going to give it four out of five. So the next is sounds. And to me, sounds are just as important as visuals. We need sounds to tell us what our engines are doing, to tell us what the airframe is doing, to tell us how many Gs we're pulling, to tell us what kind of alpha our aircraft is at. Like I keep saying in these videos, real pilots and real aircraft get all of that through their senses in terms of feel, what they can feel the aircraft doing. We get none of that. We get a screen and we get a pair of headphones. That's all we get as gamers or simmers. And so the sound engine has to be very developed for us to be able to get all of this required input. So the first thing we look at is the sound of the engine in the cockpit. I want to be able to hear this, this turbine rev all the way up and I want a distinctive sound when the afterburner is on because these things I need to be able to hear when I'm looking up at my lift vector in combat. It may not be realistic that you can hear them, but they are something that we need. pretty good you can hear that you can hear the rpm changes all the way up to mil power and the afterburner is completely over the top as you can hear but it's fine and it sounds good it sounds grunty it makes you feel a man sitting in here with that bloody great big afterburner on the engine's not too whiny like the f5 it's a good all-round sound whether it's realistic i'm not sure i did see a mig 21 the other day at an air show and it to be honest didn't sound anything like this but you know i can live with that Next we'll look outside and this is where it starts to break down. Listen to the volume, the decibels here. And listen to the decibel here. Uh, why they haven't fixed this is beggar's belief. It's so quiet outside this module that when I do my videos I have to put this up over 35 or 37 percent. I have to increase the sound game for this jet here in my video to sound the same as an F5 or a albatross or a c101 it's so quiet it's incredibly frustrating can't be that hard for them to fix this i mean this is literally sitting next to the airplane this is how loud it is back inside much louder so i will be penalizing them for that it just simply need sorting it's not right let's listen to the engine outside It sounds a bit arcadey, you know how that afterburner just comes on, it doesn't sound like in real life how the afterburner just transitions like that, but it's not too bad. The main problem, like I said, if I had an F5 here with much weaker, less powerful engines, they would be twice as loud nearly as these are here, and it just makes, especially in movies and stuff, it makes it really stupid. So I'd really like to get that sorted, and it will be, will be marked down because of that. Okay, so let's get airborne. I haven't done this for a while, so try how this is going to go but we'll try okay we've got it I need my flaps set yep they are I'm not sure if I can hear ground rumble can you hear ground rumble you should be able to hear ground rumble see what it's like when I uh, lift off Now, I don't think there was any ground rumble there, so that's another problem that needs you need to be able to hear when your wheels are on the ground. You're up. Oh god, I can't remember how to do this. Uh, ping, ping, ping. Ping. There we go. Uh, so that's, uh, yeah, that's something that's missing. The next thing we're going to look at is doing high G turns. What we want to be able to do is hear the stresses on the airframe like we said it's something you have to have in DTS being a virtual pilot so we get the burners on sorry about the loud noise but that's just how it is and we're going to um, we're going to do some high G maneuvers and see if we can hear any stresses on the airframe a kind of whooshing sound of the wings and whatnot I 
I think I can hear the wind noise increasing, so that's good. Yeah, I can definitely hear the wind noise increasing. So that gives me an indication of how fast I am without looking down at my instruments. Right, I'll do my best not to black out. So I can hear my guy uh, struggling to breathe, so it's got that, which is good. The alpha is going to start heading up now as we get slower. Warnings coming on, probably over alphaing. I can't hear anything. The only thing about that is I couldn't hear any sounds like you get in most of the other planes that are telling me that we're over alphaing. I know we had a judder there from the engine, but try that again, shall we? Watch that angle of attack down at the bottom. I want to hear a, something that can tell me that I'm over alphering. No, there's nothing there. Either the afterburn is too loud and we can't hear it, whoops, or um, it's just not there. I don't know what that warning light is, so I'm just going to shut it up like that. So inside, I'd rate it good in that we can hear the engine exactly what the engine's doing. That's good because some planes have that completely messed up in DCS. The bad thing is I can't hear any interaction with the outside world with the sounds in here. I can't ha hear obvious grumbling of the wheels and we need that when we're landing. I can't hear when the airframe is stressed. I can hear when the, the G-low because my guy struggles to breathe, but I need to hear alpha just as much or more importantly than I do for G-load. You know, if I was a real pilot, I'll be looking up here in a dogfight. I haven't got time to look down here at my alpha meter. Um, I have to be able to feel it. And so I have to have that sound given to me. It doesn't be there. So strong bases, missing a few bits. Next is the exter external sound while moving outside. Let me just get myself leveled off. Ooh. Just too quiet. Listen to the difference. It's frustratingly, it's so annoying that really gets my goat and again it will just be really quiet way too quiet that sounded good at least they've got that bit right although it was too quiet that did sound just like a real afterburner that must be something new they put in recently because that was, didn't used to have that we come back in and it's actually a lot louder outside the actual sounds are fine i've never had a problem with the mig 21 sounds but and this may not affect 99 percent of you but for me making videos at the end of the day it's too quiet so to summarize inside good strong sounds but it's missing a bunch or if it's not missing them i can't hear them either way what does it matter outside it sounds nice way too quiet very annoying I should also mention that we get uh, you know we can press buttons and click switches and stuff and we get some sound from that as well, but to be honest, inside, I don't think you're going to hear it over the engines anyway. I think maybe we'll talk, that, talk about that on another section. Uh, so, as far as uh, rating goes, then I'm going to rate that 3 out of 5. I know that's going to trigger all the fans out there who think it's perfect, but it's not. I've told you exactly why it's not. It's just how it is. So, we're going to do a 3 and hope that those little bits get fixed or changed. I suppose I'll get in trouble for saying fixed now, but changed. Okay, next we're going to look at interactivity and detail. So this is how we can interact with our cockpit. How well is the in interactivity model? What, how many switches can I flick? How many switches do what they're supposed to do? What does it feel like when I'm switching those switches? And so on. So we're just going to have a, a little look around. First of all, it's obviously a very complicated cockpit. Uh, now, from first looking at this uh, about a year ago, I don't remember uh, switches that weren't modelled, etc. But we'll have a quick look around. So... I found the first one already. These switches back here, for instance, I click on them and I can't actually I can't actually use them. 
So that's a problem right away. There's something there that I can rotate, but I can't actually rotate. Switches here may or may not do something, but they don't make a sound. I want them to make a clunk, clunk, clunk. How hard is it to do that? Like in the Vigan, excellent example of that. Clunk, clunk, clunk. So that's annoying me a bit. No sound. I mean, it, 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 it is doing what it's supposed to do, but this is enables the arc or the RSPN. There's no sound of the switch lug being lugged. There is for that one. No sound. Or if there are sounds again, I can't hear them above. Quite a bit of noise. I want to be able to hear. That one doesn't do anything. Even if they don't do anything, I would like them, or more likely you guys would like them, so that you can at least switch them up and down. Not sure what that is, but it doesn't move either. That doesn't move. That makes a sound. All of these are modelled, they all do their things from what I remember. I wonder if I can put my gear up. <laughs> That's pretty cool, right? <laughs> No sound again. Oh, my OCD is getting triggered. That's got a sound. So, you know, that's okay. No sound. So I'll say probably 90. Brilliant. 90 to 95 percent of the interactive bits are model i'm not going to sit and count them all obviously this is all model all of this model all of it does something i remember this none of this is modeled none of it's clickable none of this is clickable these guys are and they do do stuff these guys do do stuff these guys don't appear to be shut up these guys don't seem to do anything. The radar looks feeble, but that's because obviously the, the actual real, you know, the real radar display looks feeble. So it's a good interpretation uh, in terms of the detail of the radar. I've never seen any problems with that. And there aren't any MFDs or anything to look at, so. Well, we certainly can't rate it out of five because not everything is modeled. So the switches aren't particularly satisfying to so tick when they haven't got any sound just some little annoyances in there in terms of the actual detail of what's in there it's all pretty top notch detail i'm thinking of four interactivity i'm thinking of 3.5 so why don't we settle on a 3.75 for the mig 21 for detail and interactivity as well as that i can check some other stuff emergency yeah all this stuff works <laughs> that's quite cool right must be compressed air or something Okay, so next we want to get on to the flight model. For that, I'm going to grab a new plane so I can have a window. Relatively good ground interactivity, how we are landing gear engaged with the ground, how we can kind of slip and slide. It is very unforgiving, this plane, needless to say. It's uh, landing and taking off is not to be taken lightly in an aircraft like this. Like we said before, I'm not particularly interested in how accurate it is to the real MiG-21 within reason, you know, it has to be pretty accurate. But what I'm more interested in is how it feels to me. Does it immerse me? Does it make me feel like I'm driving a real MiG-21? As well as that, can I feel the weight of the aircraft? Can I feel the momentum of the aircraft? And the answer to all of those things is yes, it does it well. It does it almost too much. It's um, you can really feel the weight of this thing, the gravity, really trying to pull you down all the time. Uh, alpha is pretty well modelled and um, G-loadings, really feel like you can feel those G-loadings. Of course I can't, but the way that the model's set up, you can really feel that stuff. Roll feels good. 
see the way my head's moving in the cockpit as well. Pulling a G's, I can actually, um, I can flame out my engine. If I pull too many, I think it's negative G's, I can flame out my engine, it's, it's good they've got in there. Uh, they've got that in there and you have to do an emergency restart. Of course, this was before the day to fly by wire, so all we've got some basic stability systems and um, it's very easy for me to um, to crash this aeroplane it will do pretty much everything that i ask it to do and if that means it's going to stall the aircraft then it will let me do that so i've got full control over it and all that stuff seems to be very convincing in how it's modeled i'm going to pull some high g turns get some speed up Feels excellent with that big sound as well. It feels really good. I'll see if I can do something silly up here. Try and upset it. Where am I? Ha <laughs> Look, I'm flying all funny. Oh, but I've recovered it. What have I? This may be a stool. No, I'm okay. How about that? So you can do all kinds of, like I said, because I've got full control, I could do all kinds of weird turns. I can end up flying backwards. All kinds of cool stuff I can do. Let's see if we can go up and do a tail slide. I don't know if we can do it, but we'll try. <laughs> tail slide and back down power on yeah so uh, really happy with it and and it, it is difficult to fly we'll talk about that in difficult oh we stalled our engine look so we'll have to go and do an emergency start now everything feels very convincing there's no weird bits there's no nothing that will uh, ruin your immersion it all feels really good the windmilling of the engine etc here all really well modeled uh really hard to find a fault I'm, I'm struggling to find a fault with it to be honest I've already talked about how un, uh, about how it reacts on the ground. It reacts is very unforgiving, but um, you know we can't mark it down for that. It is just difficult on the ground, but it all feels right. Just about everything in the air feels right. Um, so I don't think I've anything added to that. I think we'll try a um, try an emergency landing, shall we? Look, the button doesn't make a sound when I press it. Grr. Oh, that's not good timing. That's definitely bad timing. We're going to have to go through them. Let me out. Hey! That's not bad, right? <laughs> Very good. Very good. Only I could end up ejecting in a bloody buyer's guide. So in terms of a rating, I don't think I can quite bring myself to give it five. I mean, it's uh, it's lacking just a tiny bit compared to the top fighters, the F-18 and the F-14. It doesn't have, uh, it does have kind of uh, wingtip uh, vortices, but it doesn't have vapor clouds uh, and stuff like that when it's pulling high alphas to any degree, at least that I'm aware of, correct me if I'm wrong. So it's not quite on the pinnacle, but it's bloody good. Uh, so I'm going to, and rewarding as well to fly this thing. Although you're not going to do much damage generally compared to an F-18, it's uh, very rewarding to do it. So I think for the flight model, we have to give it a 4.5. Next is difficulty. So there's different ways of looking at this. There is, it is a big complex cockpit and you need to understand pretty much all of these systems or most of these systems to be able to fly effectively at all. So it's not something you can just jump in. It is study level. It does need, you do need to study the manual if you're going to go into this really in depth and actually be effective with it because it's not by any means user friendly. That said, once you know what everything does, it's relatively easy to operate. The vast majority of all this stuff you don't use, you just use a few of them. So to actually operate it on a daily day to day basis is not too difficult. But then again, this aircraft is a difficult aircraft to fly. I know it will trigger the M MiG-21 enthusiasts. It's a difficult aircraft to fly. It's hard to take off. 
it's hard to land it's hard to negotiate with a heavy ordnance it's hard to use in a crosswind it's hard to use in a bloody light wind it's difficult to do attacks really easy to stall your engine especially if you don't get to use this a lot you get to fly it once a month you're really going to struggle with it like me so in terms of difficulty it is up there it's not something unless you're a veteran simmer if you're a veteran simmer fine come and buy it you will love it i guarantee you for someone that just wants to get into dcs it's i would say it's not for you it, i'd say it's going to end up being frustrating if you're going to learn to try and fly your first airplane as a mig 21 that's modeled well so i don't think i can put it five out of five because it simply hasn't got that many systems to worry about as compared to an a10c or something like that it doesn't need 400 pages of reading before you can get on with it but it is it is absolutely by no means easy now i put the vigan at four because the vigan does also require lots of reading but you can't just get in it and you know start firing uh, RB, uh, RB15s off so because it is difficult I think I'm going to rate it 4.5 out of 5 in terms of difficulty uh, may come down when I've tested the other planes but that's my gut feeling should be right up there but not at the very top okay so I did promise that we'd look at the kinetic ability so if we start with peak sustain rate at 50% gas where the F-18C at 420k task can achieve a sustained 22 degrees per second I'm afraid our MiG-21 is all the way down there now if anyone's looking at buying a MiG-21 you will all already be aware by basic physics that it's going to be bad at turning so we can achieve a maximum between a band of 480 to 520 KTAS at 14 degrees per second. Next, instant altitude. How much we can get in a climb instantaneously. 82,000 feet or just above, which uh, at least you can boast to your F-18 uh, friends who are playing on easy mode that uh, you can get higher than them. Not much compared to the F-14. Next, our sustained ceiling in DCS is unfortunate. Fortunately, very low. I'm not sure the reason for that. Probably because it's tiny wings and high wing loading, I would imagine. Next, it's max speed. So if we can... Oh, did it even make it onto the... It did. And again, it beat the F-18 and it beat the Vigan. This is high altitude speed. It got 1249 KTAS at instantaneous and sustained. So that means in a dive as well as level at Mach 2.18 before you get an engine flame out. Uh, so it's Mach 2.2. So that's pretty good. Low altitude speed, it's third from the bottom at 741 KTAS, Mach 1.12, at which point I get a flame out. There may be ways of getting around that uh, with a special art of manner mode, but that's the highest I could get on a fair test. Low altitude acceleration, mm, pretty miserable to be honest, is not a fast accelerating plane by any means, but it kicks the ass of the F5E. Look at that, it's, that's its contemporary uh, guy there, it's much faster than an F5E. Uh, that's 300 to 650 KTAS on the deck. Same 650, 300 to 650 KTAS, but at Angels 15. We are second from bottom, so pretty miserable to be honest, but at least it does beat the F5 still. Climb rate from a QR Ray standstill is pretty miserable, but at least it beats the F5. The climb rate from 600 knots is actually reasonable, only just behind a flanker. So once you get this thing up to speed, she will climb. And look at the difference between uh, where's that? It's a good. In fact, it's only slightly better than the F5E, but it is better. So next, we're going to look at its history. So it was released in what early 2015. It's what four and a half years old, and you can see it's starting to show its age a little bit. You can see around the cockpit stuff like that, just that we picked up on generally in terms of how it's aged, in terms of bugs, problem. All DCS aircraft have been bugged throughout their life cycle and that's because DCS is constantly developing constantly changing and all of the aircraft are going to have bugs it's just the nature of the beast if they just left it alone and never touched the engine then stuff wouldn't break but that's you know that's the price of progress MiG-21 to mean I've never flown it a lot and I've only started flying it relatively recently has been what I'd call medium it's not been as bugged as something like the Harrier which is probably that had the worst history of all of the jets and I don't know any specific bugs that have had the MiG-21s like uh, for the MiG-21 I guess you guys are gonna have to help fill that fill me in on that but anecdotally it's had what I called an average four and a half year service history in DCS certainly nothing in there that would put you off it I know one thing that I think is still continuing is it has a small visual bug uh, only really relevant to people like the Grim Reapers who fly with 10 man formations. It causes uh, CPU problems when we bring into close formation. When we scatter again and we're several miles away from each other, our CPUs will return to normal and the frame rates return to normal. When the MiG-21s come back into the formation, everything slows down again. Something we've had for maybe two years now. As far as I'm aware, 
it's not been fixed but uh, I haven't tried it for a few months at least so in summary I haven't got a great deal of detail for that my apologies feel free to add stuff to the comments and I'll put that to the top but um, nothing critical nothing that I would say that would want to put you off buying a MiG-21 so in summary it's a really good module um, and everyone I've spoken to who's bought this module has loved it yes it's difficult but most people who fly DCS like difficult things you know you don't get into DCS because it's easy you get into War Thunder because it's easy no disrespect to War Thunder but you know you, you know what I mean and the people that get into this plane and learn to fly properly not like me I cannot fly this plane at all I'm not man enough I'll hold my hand up but people get into it absolutely they love it and they'll fly it all the time if they can and I completely understand why same with me in the F5 but the F5 suits me better it's a lot simpler for my little simple brain so I insist if you've got spare money out there go and buy the MiG-21 I've explained how it is fairly niche in this video and how it's not easy to fly but it is very rewarding because of those things and relatively unique rarely do we see MiG-21s in our formations and that's it I hope you enjoy your MiG-21s and I'll see you later